On December 9th, the very last airworthy Antonov AN-22, the largest turboprop transport ever to fly, broke apart in mid-air during a post-repair test flight over Russia's Ivanovo region, killing all seven people on board. This is William, and welcome to Black Box Analyst. Let's have a look. First, let's talk about the giant in the center of this crash. The Antonov AN-22 first lifted off in 1965, in an era when the Soviet Union was pushing the limits of military heavy lift capability. It wasn't just another transport. It was the first wide-body cargo aircraft in the world and, for decades, the largest turboprop ever operated. Its arrival fundamentally changed how the Soviet Air Force could move armored divisions, missile systems, and mass paratrooper units across vast distances. This was not a niche airplane. It was engineered to shift battlefields. Only 68 were ever built, and by the time this crash occurred in December 2025, just a handful remained. It had been in operation since 1975, with registration Romeo Foxtrot 08832, also known as Vasily Semenenko. In fact, this aircraft was widely reported to be the final serviceable AN-22 in Russia's inventory. That matters, because when you are down to a single surviving operational airframe of a type, every hour flown carries not just risk, but irreplaceable consequence. When we talk about the AN-22's size and power, it's easy to drift into abstraction, so let's make it tangible. Each of its four NK-1 2MA turboprop engines produced roughly 14,800 horsepower. To put that in perspective, one engine generates more power than many regional jets produce across both of their turbofans combined. And those engines didn't spin conventional props, they turned massive sets of contra-rotating blades, two interlocked discs per engine, each more than six meters wide. That system produced enormous thrust while helping control torque on a fuselage far larger than anything else, turning propellers at the time. Then there's the airframe itself. The cavernous, unpressurized cargo bay stretched more than 30 meters and could swallow tanks, trucks, missile launchers, or nearly 300 troops on dual decks. Its twin tail design wasn't just aesthetic, it provided stability in asymmetric engine situations and reduced the overall tail height, which made hangar operations easier in remote Soviet bases. The wing and flap system, huge double-slotted lift devices combined with the engine slipstream, gave the aircraft short field performance that belied its enormous footprint. That capability came at a cost. The airframe endured tremendous cyclical stress during decades of heavy operations. This particular unit had passed 50 years of service. It had been declared retired, transferred toward museum placement, and later returned to flying status. And that raises a quiet but central question. When a platform this old is reactivated, how much life can safely be restored? Engineers can reinforce ribs, replace wiring, and overhaul gearboxes. But the cumulative fatigue in a half-century-old cargo giant is not theoretical, it is physical, lived into the metal. On December 9th, the aircraft departed on a scheduled post-maintenance test flight from its base area near Ivankovo village in Ivanovo Oblast, northeast of Moscow. On board were seven personnel, five flight crew, and two additional specialists. All were lost. Shortly after takeoff, witnesses reported seeing the aircraft shedding major sections of structure while still airborne. Not fragments, not minor pieces, large fuselage components falling separately, some landing directly into the icy waters of the Uvodskoye Reservoir. That mid-air breakup is not a matter of interpretation. Debris was later photographed floating on the water and recovery crews confirmed both land and submerged wreckage sites. When an aircraft fails in flight, one of the earliest questions is always whether the breakup was a consequence of aerodynamic load, internal failure, or external damage. Investigators have so far been unambiguous on one point. There is no indication of hostile action or external strike. No interceptor involvement, no reported explosion signatures, no missile trail. That simplifies the early frame of inquiry. It doesn't answer why the structure failed, but it does narrow the scope of what teams will be looking for as they collect wing spars, fuselage frames, and internal support elements from both the shore and the reservoir floor. Recovery operations began immediately. Search crews staged from both land and water, and given the size of the components involved, hoisting and securing segments became the first priority before winter conditions locked the reservoir in ice. For an investigation like this, access to intact major pieces is critical. When a breakup occurs in dry terrain, 
mapping the debris field can offer a linear record of the disintegration sequence. Over a lake, that becomes far more complicated and the timeline tightens. Corrosion and freezing can compromise evidence. The most sobering part of the official response is its tone. The language has been restrained and, in some respects, familiar. An aircraft unspooled in the sky, an emergency impact zone, and a technical commission already on site. But here, unlike typical military crash responses, there is an underlying acknowledgement that this wasn't just an accident, it was the end of a type. There are no more airworthy AN-22s waiting to lift off. There will be no operational successor. Why was a 50 plus year old heavy aircraft in the air on a December test flight? The answer is both logistical and geopolitical. Russia confirmed this was a post repair inspection mission, meaning the flight was not routine transport, but a technical validation following work done to return or sustain airworthiness. We do not yet know what specific systems were repaired, whether structural, avionics, engines, gear assemblies, or corrosion control. That detail has not been released. However, the strategic context is clearer than the maintenance specifics. Russia's heavy lift fleet is shrinking. The AN-124, its modern counterpart, remains in service but faces deep supply chain constraints. Engine production and overhaul pipelines traditionally tied to Ukrainian manufacturers have been interrupted by sanctions and severed industrial relationships. In that vacuum, Older platforms that would normally be eased into historical inertia are instead being pulled back toward operational necessity. This particular aircraft was tracked in 2024 as being ferried toward museum allocation, yet it did not remain in retirement. It was instead refurbished and restored to flight. In ordinary circumstances, that might seem like a dramatic reversal, but under logistical strain, the calculus shifts. When a nation requires strategic airlift capacity and newer fleets cannot scale, aging airframes are kept in motion through deep maintenance cycles, even if that means pushing against the trailing edge of safe life cycle limits. Investigative sources in Moscow used a careful phrase, technical malfunction. It is not a conclusion. It is not even an official interim finding. It is simply the initial characterization of the event, something technical, something internal, something that failed. No further attribution. No claim of maintenance error, design fatigue, or power plant rupture. Just a factual marker, the airplane came apart, and the cause, whatever it is, appears to originate within the machine itself. For a test flight, this kind of mission is typically flown by senior crews, the people most experienced with the quirks of type behavior and the demands of proving runs. They know what to expect, and more importantly, they know what normal feels like. If a vibration emerges where none should exist, if cyclic flutter begins in a wing root, if prop synchronization falls out of harmony with power output, those cues are not abstract. They are physical sensations. A veteran crew can sense through seat, stick, and cabin resonance. That makes the suddenness of the breakup particularly striking. There were no distress calls reported, no reported attempt at return. Whatever occurred, it progressed faster than human intervention could offset. The recovery team will now undertake the long, methodical work of correlating fracture lines, metallurgical signatures, rivet tear patterns, and prop hub condition. Contra-rotating systems like the AN-22s produce unique stress signatures when imbalanced, but until investigators speak, that remains background knowledge, not causality. As of now, what we know is concise. A post-maintenance AN-22, the final airworthy example of its type, lifted off on December 9th, began shedding structure in flight separated over land and water, and ended its service in the reservoir below. The cause has not been published. The evidence is still being pulled from ice-cold water. There is no external actor identified, and internal malfunction remains the preliminary phrasing. In the coming days and weeks, the technical board will release fragments of clearer assessment. Which component initiated the breakup? Whether structural fatigue showed prior signatures? What the refurbishment cycle entailed? and why this aircraft was still in service when its era had long since passed. For now, all that can be said responsibly is this. The AN-22 has flown its final sortie, not in ceremonial retirement, but in operational test flight, carrying forward the weight not just of cargo history but of fleet necessity. It was a machine built for Herculean work, kept flying beyond its original horizon, and ultimately brought down not by enemy action, but by forces within the aircraft itself. Thank you for watching. We'll come back when further details emerge. 
so make sure to subscribe to stay updated.